Good morning. Good to hear all of you today. Thank you for coming. My name is Sam. I'm the associate pastor here. Just wanted to say good morning and welcome. And uh, if you are a first time visitor, we have a connection card out on the left there as you came in. Um, and it just helps us um, get to know you a little bit and get you connected if you are interested in any of that. And we have a IOU for a gift. Usually we have gifts for you. They're getting put together right now, so they'll be, be here next week um, for Easter. So you have to come back if you're a first-time visitor for Easter. It's our trick to get you back in, in the building. Um, and if the donuts don't make you come back, then I don't know what will either. So also, to the right, donuts, coffee, danishes. Um, join us after service for 49 minutes. And uh, so... <sighs> Moving on, um, let's go over the Easter schedule real quick again. April 11th, last episode of The Chosen, season one. Heard you guys have been really enjoying that. Um, and then Wednesday, April 13th, we have a regular cowboy church in the fellowship hall. Um, Monday, sorry, Thursday, April 14th, 6.30, Monday, Thursday, communion service. And then April 17th, we'll have... 7 a.m. sunrise service down in the old church, first breakfast in the fellowship hall, first service in here, second breakfast in the fellowship hall, second service in here, and then we have our Easter egg hunt for the first time in a long time after church at 12 o'clock, um, so all of you will be able to be present while your kids chase down the eggs, and then our rummage sale is next week, sale dates are April 21st and Friday, April 22nd from 9 to 6, and Saturday, April 23rd from 9 to 3. And then donations are being taken starting Tuesday, April 19th, which leads us to the next thing is we have to set up the big white tent on Monday, April 18th. I will be starting at 10 a.m. If there is not enough people here to set up the tent, the tent is not going to get set up. <laughs> so, I need at least 10 people, able-bodied, able to lift heavy things, pound heavy stakes. So uh, I will have a roster. If it's not filled, have fun setting up your own tent. <laughs> All right, opening scripture, Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph. O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day. Be with us as we worship you and as days bring your message that we may open our hearts and minds to you, Father, that we may continue to bring your kingdom to this valley. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. For those of you who know plants, you have to look at these and use your imagination. These are COVID palms. <laughs> we ordered palms, but this is what we got because they couldn't get palms. So we're celebrating Palm Sunday with ferns. <laughs> okay, would you ra um, join me in singing hymn number 173, All Glo Glory, Laud, and Honor, all three verses. So please rise and let's sing hymn number 173 together. seated.
please rise and join me for the doxology number 625. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning. I am Ed Grief, a member of the prayer team. Let's begin our time of prayer by preparing our hearts and minds to receive and feel God's word. Lord, we are humbled by your grace that offers salvation to each and every one of us. We start today by inviting you to join us, to sit right here beside us, to make your presence known so that we feel you in our hearts. With these words, we invite you today. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Jesus, we have invited you to be in this room right now, and we believe you are. Before we get into our order of service, we would like to have a prayer with you about the condition of our world and how close we might be to seeing your return. Oh, Lord, what's next for us? Will there be a time of rescue? Might it be soon? Events are happening today that are very frightening. Lord, we pray for your comfort and peace for all of us. Show us the way, Lord. Most of us are or have recently watched The Chosen. Our small group is doing so now and our discussions have been great examples of the impact of delivering a message in a form that penetrates and stretches our ability to process and understand. We are loving it and appreciate the conversations that this has led us into. Our understanding of you, O oh Lord, is being strengthened and our hearts comforted by that knowledge. Yet at the same time, our hearts ache at the reality of how many people we know that are not committed to that knowledge. They continue in a life that does not know you, that does not have heaven and eternity with you assured. Lord, we are asking that our hearts be prepared for the action you desire of us, that we can share your will with all the people that come into our lives. Lord, help us be the messengers you wish us to be. Lord, hear our prayers. <clears throat> I will go through our prayer list now, which is fairly short, followed by a brief moment of silent prayer, and then we'll close by saying together the Lord's Prayer. And as I look out here, it's sure great. Where'd they go? There he is, head bowed. Great to have Mike Kaufman here with us this morning. Welcome back. Your presence this morning after a week of major decisions as criteria arose, our prayers have been focused on the right decisions being made by the right people. Lord, you have heard our prayers and we are. We humbly give thanks in your name. Lord, hear our prayers. Carol Sykes, update. Her daughter, Deborah, reports she is losing her cognitive and behavioral skills of speech and reasoning due to the Alzheimer's impact. Now in hospital for testing, family working with the hospital to have her placed in hospice care. Family asks for prayers for Carol's comfort. Lord, hear our prayers. Bishop Aludi in the Tanzania region that we are familiar with 
with many of you and many years of supporting and visiting them. They are at a critical point in a very dry year. Their main crop is corn, and if it doesn't receive rain soon, it will not survive. Tanzania is on the eastern coast or eastern side of Africa. I see in the world news this weekend that the west, western coast is also experiencing a similar severe drought situation. Critical need for rain in this region as well. Lord, hear our prayers. Corey's cousin Jerry has been placed in uh, palliative care. Prayers for the family to develop a relationship with Jesus. Lord, hear our prayers. We have heard that Bart Peterson has a serious situation caused by very large kidney stone. We don't have detailed information or an update to share at this point. And as we learn more, we'll get him further on the prayer list. This one in this morning, Dan's father-in-law, Jack, has undergone cancer surgery and will have an ongoing future treatment. Lord, hear our prayers. We've lifted these folks up to you now and, and just ask for your blessing on them. We'll have a moment of silent prayer and then we'll close together doing the Lord's Prayer. So a moment of silent prayer, please. Please join me in saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is great seeing you this morning. Glad that you're here on this uh, at the beginning of Holy Week. Here, it's a uh, it, it's just great to see everybody here this morning as we move into what is the greatest week in history. That's our title of our series for the next two or three weeks. Before we get into that, I want to share with you just a couple of things. Uh, uh, la last week we talked about that eight to fifteen list a little bit, if you will recall. Uh, and if you weren't here, then we'll fill you in on that a little bit. Took a quick survey of, of, of where we are on that. I wanted to give you some results on that just so that you'll know, know where we're at. Um, when I asked if you had an 8 to 15 list, about half of the folks said, yes, we do. That was cool because I figured after two years of isolation, and that was going to be a, that was gonna be a, be a challenge to make sure that we were con connecting with the 8 to 15 people that God's placed in our lives. Half of the folks said, yeah, I've got one. However, 80% of those who had one hadn't updated it in a while. So, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be driving you nuts. I'm going to be mentioning it on a fairly regular basis from this point on. I want to remind you of what an 8 to 15 list is. It's the 8 to 15 people that God has supernaturally placed in your life. They will listen to you about Christ. They will listen to you about the gospel. They will listen to you about the good news of Christ's crucifixion for our sins and his resurrection for our eternal life. They will listen to you before they're going to listen to anybody else. Because of your life experiences, because of shared experiences, because simply you are just absolutely a wonderful human being. Whatever it might be, they're going to listen to you before they're going to listen to me or Sam or Kathy or anybody else. So what we challenge ourselves to do is to make a list of those 8 to 15 people prayerfully. Just say, Lord, who are the 8 to, eight to 15 people you've placed in my life? Who are they? Write their names down on a list. We have these cards out there for you. 
Just write your write the names down. Keep it keep it current. You know, as somebody moves to Peoria, Illinois, they're no longer in your regular sphere of influence. So they come off your list. You don't have to stop praying for them, but they move out of that realm of being one of the eight to fifteen people that you have regular contact with and regular interaction with. So make that list of people. Keep it up to date. Pray for them every day by name. All of this stuff's on the back of the card, so you don't have to write it down or remember it today. But uh, pray for them every day by name. Just live a Jesus-honoring life before them. That doesn't mean perfect because we are not perfect people. Sometimes the most Jesus-honoring thing we do is own up to our own imperfections and our need for Jesus' salvation. So just do it, live a Christ-honoring life before them. When the appropriate time comes, and you'll, the Holy Spirit will prompt you, don't try to create the opportunities. Let the Holy Spirit create the opportunity to speak with them about your faith in some way, either sharing with them what Christ has done in your life or just inviting them to church, just saying, hey, we've got Easter. You know, it's the Easter celebration next week. We've got breakfast and, and, and worship. Come, come have a free meal, if nothing else. You know, it may be something like that. Whatever it is, when the Holy Spirit prompts and as the Holy Spirit gives opening, speak to those people. And then let God do his work, whatever he does in that particular moment. And then let somebody else that you trust ask you about that list regularly. Just let them ask you about that stuff. You know, Who goes on your 8 to 15 list? Anybody that you think is not quite where they need to be in terms of their relationship with Christ. It may be somebody who's never accepted Christ. It may be somebody who at one time was, was involved with the community of faith but has drifted away simply because of, uh, because of some, some hurt, some pain, or just life got in the way. It could be a, a, any number of people who go on your 8 to 15 list, but make sure that you begin co connecting with those people, at least in your own mind and heart, and praying for them regularly by, by name every day. Like I said, these cards are out on the desk. Sam's got them out there. You can just pick one up. We don't charge for these. They're free of charge, okay? So go ahead and pick one up as you, uh, as you head out. Make sure that you are, are, are working on those 8 to 15 people that are in your life because the, the important thing for them to do is to get to know Jesus. Let me be clear about this. This is not a church growth scheme, you know? I don't care if they ever walk in the door here or not. As long as they get connected to Jesus and then get connected to the body of Christ somewhere, that's what matters. I don't care if I see them here as long as we see them in heaven, okay? That's what we're shooting for with the 8 to 15 list. So keep that in mind. Like I said, since we're getting back into the, into the swing of things, I'll be reminding you regularly about the 8 to 15 list, okay? It won't be every week. It won't be every other week. But every so often, I will be reminding you of it. And then when I get 80% of the crowd rolling their eyes going, here he goes again, I'll know we've kinda, we're kind of back in the swing of things, all right? That's what we're shooting for. Okay, the greatest week in history. That's what we begin to celebrate here today. It was to our, to, to, at least to the best calculations that many make, it was Sunday, March the 29th through Sunday, the, April the 5th, 33 A.D. There are some people who believe it was A.D. 30, and we, can, we won't bother with that, the, 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 the way those calculations vary. Uh, it's, it's, you know, but as we match things up, it, you know, at least from my perspective, most likely, March the 29th through April the 5th, 33 A.D. It is the greatest week in history because it was the week that the Heavenly Father had been planning for since the, almost the dawn of humanity. From the moment that Adam messed it up for all of us, God had it in his mind and in his heart to bring the events of this particular week to pass. It was the week of our salvation. Let's read about it as it began. 
in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise God in the highest heaven! The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the table of the money changers and the chairs of those who were selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priest and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany and stayed there overnight. The greatest week in history when God shows up. Let's pray and unpack it for a couple of moments here today. Heavenly Father, as we, uh, as we listen through the corridors of time to the, to the account of when your son showed up, Father, may it challenge us and change us. May we rejoice in the moment that he showed up in our lives, and may we be challenged to let him show up again and again and again. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Singer Lauren Hill said, We don't want people to have expectations of us, but then we have expectations of everybody else. Isn't that very, very human? <laughs> Isn't that true of all of us? Most of us will have expectations of how others will act around us, how others will work into our lives. We have expectations of how things should be going, right? Yeah. We have expectations of how the uh, of how the world should run, right? You know, you know, you know. Greater benefits, lower taxes. That's what we always want, right? How does that work? <laughs> It doesn't. That's how it works, you know? Those are, these are the types of things we, we, we think about all the time. We have expectations of everybody else, but we don't want anybody to have expectations of us, right? That is the way humanity works. That's what we do all the time. And things were no different on March the 29th, April uh, 33 A.D., than they are for those of us who live in Florence in 2022. Things are no diff were no different in human nature then than they are today. It was on March the 29th, or, uh, March, 
March the 27th, 33 A.D., that Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, who is, say it with me, the Messiah of Israel and the Lord of the world. That's when he entered Jerusalem. And unlike his previous, previous visits there, he visited there in a different fashion this time. Ordinarily, he had just come as one of the crowd to celebrate one of the many Jewish festivals. He'd come there to the temple. He'd come there to worship. He'd come there to praise. He'd come there to offer the sacrifices that were, off, that were commanded in the, in, the, in the law. He'd come there just to be part of the crowd. But on this particular day, he enters Jerusalem in a very different fashion. Sam read for us at the very beginning of our service today the prophet, prophecy from Zechariah. He read that prophecy that they connected with the Messiah of Israel, the people of Israel did. And they had been waiting for years. They had been waiting for generations for the one who would deliver them and set things right again to show up at Jeru in, in Jerusalem riding on the donkey, the king of Israel coming on the, on the beast of peace. I didn't mean for that to come out that way, but it does kind of rhyme, doesn't it? The beast of peace. That's, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize that was going to happen. <sighs> because when the, when, the, when, the, when, when the king rode the horse, it was the sign that he was ready for battle. When the king rode the donkey, it was the sign that he came with peace in his mind and heart. And on this occasion, Jesus calls to his disciples. He says, go get the donkeys. They knew what that meant. It wasn't a shock to them. They'd been waiting for this moment. That's the reason many of them had chosen to follow Christ when he, when he invited them to come follow me. Be my disciple. They expected that he, would, he was the anointed one who would reestablish re Israel's relationship with God. And when he said, bring the donkeys, they knew full well the prophecy of Zechariah. They knew what Jesus was about in this particular moment. So they went and got the donkeys. They brought them back to Beth, Beth Page. It's about you know, it's, it's barely a mile, mile and a half, two miles from Jeru from the gates of the Jerusalem city. You're talking about a half hour, right? You know, good hikers can cover a mile in, how, in, in what period of time if you're walking on your own? 10 to 15 minutes, you know? You're talking a half hour away from Jerusalem. They brought the donkeys back. They threw their coats as blankets for the, for, for the king to ride. And he mounted that, those, those beasts and began his journey toward Jerusalem. It was the Passover celebration. People were gathering there in that city in order to, in order to celebrate Israel's greatest moment of liberation, their liberation from Egypt. And they can see, you can almost envision it. If you can imagine, just, just, just look towards the bitter roots and imagine a wide open, you know, you, know, you know, imagine a clear cut and you can see coming down this path a man and his, and, and his followers and he's riding the donkey. They knew exactly what that meant. They went out to, the, they went out to meet him halfway. They began singing and shouting. Ed Grief was talking to me earlier. He said, did they do a, do, did they do a John Philip Sousa march as he came in? Well, in terms of ancient Israel, yes, they did. They began singing the Psalms. There may have been a tambourine or two. There may have been some sort of, sort, sort of instrument, instrumentation there. Who knows what it was? But the people be began to gather around him, and the crowd grew larger and larger as the Messiah of Israel and the Lord of the world came to the holy city in peace. Blessed be the son of David, they cried. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were cutting the palm branches or reasonable facsimiles thereof. 
They were, cu- they were cutting the palm branches off the trees and laying them down before him in sign of celebration. It was their version of the red carpet they rolled out. For the king who had come in peace, the king who had come to restore Israel. Unlike all of those other times when he had often entered into the city anonymously and when, uh, when he had often entered into the temple just as one of the common worshipers along with everyone else, this time was different. This time he came declaring openly before all who he, who he is, Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, and the Lord of the world. There was no doubt in anybody's mind about who he is or what he was doing there. There was no doubt in their minds about what he was doing there. But they did have it a little bit confused. You know, you can be absolutely certain of something wrong, Has anybody ever done that? Just me, right? (laughs) Because you guys are intelligent. You're smart. You would never make the mistake of being absolutely certain of something that is incorrect. I can't tell you the number of times I have been absolutely certain of something that is incorrect. I can't tell you the number of times that Beth has asked me for a certain something that I that she that I was supposed to give her, and I will swear up and down. I know you shouldn't swear, but I do it anyway. I would swear up and down, honey. I gave that to you last week. I don't know what you did with it, but it's not my fault. I put it in your hand. I know specifically where you were standing when I put it in your hand. I am absolutely certain that I gave it to you. And I am absolutely certain that I gave it to her until the moment I find it on my desk. I heard somebody say amen to that. (laughs) Have you ever been absolutely certain and you've been wrong? Folks, The people who were welcoming Jesus that day, nearly every single one of them, from Jesus' disciples forward, to the people who gathered around him, to the leaders who were very concerned about what was going on, every single one of them was absolutely certain that they knew his purpose and his mission. And they missed it. They were absolutely, certainly wrong. The people who followed him into the city, the people who met him on that hillside and began spreading the palm fronds in front of his in, in, in front of those beasts of burden as they came in, as they came in, they, they, they believed that it was freedom at last. Here he is, the liberator. We have been under the thumb of so many different groups for so long. The Babylonians to the Greeks and now the Romans, we have been enslaved and, 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 and under the under the authority of these terrible regimes for as long as we can remember. And finally, the one who is going to liberate us from Rome, the one who is going to give us our own country, the one who is going to make us free and independent at long, long last is finally here. Praise the Son of David. Hosanna to God in the highest Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. That's what they thought Jesus was there to do, to kick the Romans out and give them authority over their country again. 
Folks, they were absolutely certain. They were wrong. From the moment he stepped into this world until the moment he left this world, Jesus did not remove the authority of Rome. That was not what he was about. It was about something bigger. Their expectations of Jesus they were certain they knew what he was doing, but they were wrong. The leaders had expectations of Jesus. As they heard the children in the temple, as they heard all of this, 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 this rumble from the people that surrounded him, they were concerned because they had at least an uneasy arrangement with Rome. Yes, Rome was in charge, and they couldn't get rid of them. But if at least they kept the people in line, they could sort of live life the way they wanted under Roman authority. This crazy crowd that was talking about this, this, this two-bit prophet from Nazareth, man, they could upset the equilibrium we have established with our overseers. They could upset the apple cart and make things different. This Jesus guy needs to help keep everybody in line and maintain the status quo. That was their expectation of him. Any either of those expectations sound familiar? Do we expect Jesus today? Jesus, give us freedom. Lord, make my life better. Lord, make you know, change things the way that, I, that, that make my life more comfortable and more serene and give me a chance just to enjoy breathing a little longer. Is that what we expect of him? Or do we expect Jesus, Jesus, make sure that nothing changes in this world so that nothing happens to my 401k? Ouch. You know? Jesus, isn't it your job to maintain the status quo? Those expectations aren't so unfamiliar to us, are they? We are certain we know what Jesus should do in our lives. Right up until the moment we find out we are wrong. Folks, as the, Lord, as the Messiah of Israel and the Lord of the world entered the holy city that day, for the first time, clearly before the world, owning that identity, Yes, this is who I am. I am the one that Zechariah told you to expect. I am the one who has come to bring peace and God's rule and reign to this world in which we live. He came to do it in a very different way. He came not to fulfill their expectations, but to share clearly what God ex God's expectations were of them. They were saying, we want, we, we, we want him to kick out the Romans, or we want him to keep the people quiet so that the Romans don't, kick, don't, don't get mad at us. And Jesus said, here are my expectations of you. Give yourselves to God, Him only, Him completely. That's what that whole thing about the temple was, because the temple had become, had become somewhat, at least in part, for those who were running the operation, somewhat of a business venture. And He said, this is suppo not supposed to be a business venture for you, we are worshiping the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength here. And as he cleared things out, 
And as he listened to the cries of the children that day, he said, this is what the temple is for. This is the calling of your life. It is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. From the moment you get up to the moment you lie down, you are keenly aware that He, the Lord your God, is one. He's the one who makes everything possible. He's the one who allows you to get up in the morning. He is the one who orders the steps of your day. He is the one who, through the trials and tribulations that you might face in this, in this day, walks beside you each and every day. Give yourselves to Him, to Him only, to Him completely. Jesus said, I fulfill none of your expectations. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to explain to you the expectations the Father has of you and to make them possible by what I do in the days to come. Folks, the question we too often ask is, what do we expect of Jesus? The question we should be asking is, what does Jesus expect of us. The Apostle Paul painted a picture of it in Philippians chapter 2. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, some scholars believe it is the oldest Christian hymn recorded. They believe that Paul was quoting one of the most ancient songs of the Christian faith as he wrote these words in Philippians chapter 2. What are the expectations that Jesus has of you and me? You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took humble pos the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's the echo of what the Old Testament prophet said. He has shown you, O oh man, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. At the beginning of the greatest week in history, the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, and the Lord of the world rode into that town proclaiming himself to be exactly who he was. Coming in peace to reconcile all of humanity to the Father who loved them. And here's what he expects of you, he said. Do justly love mercy. Humble yourself in the same way I have humbled myself. Give yourself as a servant in the same way I have given myself as a servant. Have this attitude in you that I have demonstrated before you is in me. 
Folks, it's a great thing to consider as we go through Holy Week this week. Folks, Jesus always shows up as king. Everyone will eventually see that. The sooner we see it and love him for it, the better. So this week, read Philippians 2, 5 through 11 every day. Intentionally engage in Holy Week worship with your heart attuned to worshiping Jesus as the king and embracing his expectation of us. Folks, it's not our expectations of him that matter. It's his expectation of us that we should consider. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, a man is not far from the gates of heaven when he is fully submissive to the Lord's will. Let's let that be the center of our Holy Week celebration as we remember the greatest week in history. Let's pray together. Father, may we simply be focused on your expectations of us. Father, may this week be a reminder of what you have done for us to make the fulfillment of those expectations within us not only possible, but a joyous moment with you each and every day. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Before we sing our last hymn, I'd just like to say that um, Sam had mentioned putting up the big white tent for the church, and we're also going to use it for the rummage sale. And he jokingly said, you know, if you don't come, it won't get up and stuff, but it doesn't mean you have to be able to bench press 500 pounds. It just means you, you come with the strength that you have, and God will be with you. So we hope that if you can come and, and share an hour to help to put that tent up on the day after Easter at 10 o'clock, which is Monday the 18th of, of April, we could sure use your help. Okay, well, the last hymn we're going to sing is hymn number 172, which is Tell Me the Story of Jesus, and we're just going to sing the refrain. So if you would please rise, we'll sing Tell Me the Story of Jesus. story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story of your precious, sweetest that ever was heard. God bless you as you go from this place today. May he use you to touch the lives of those 8 to 15 people that he has placed close to you. May you share with them the joy of what Christ has done for them on this greatest week in history. Thanks for being here today. To say, hi, say hi to somebody before you take off. Have a great week.